Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please put your hands together and welcome to the stage Guardian Colonist Gabby Hensliff and the Right Honourable Sir Oliver Luck. everyone and welcome back. Delighted to be joined this afternoon by Sir Oliver Letwin, former cabinet minister, policy brains to more conservative leaders than probably either he or I care to remember, and for the purposes of this afternoon, chair of the independent review of Build Out, commissioned by the Prime Minister to get to the bottom of why house building aspirations don't always uh, match up in practice with what gets built. Uh, it's publishing its final report this autumn, but last week a draft analysis emerged, so we're hoping for a few early insights today. And to help us look at some of the issues that arise in more detail, I'm also delighted to be joined uh, at my far left, your right, by Simon Ridley, Director General of Decentralisation and Growth um, at the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, who's probably best described as the force behind all things devolution, and, Dave <laughs> and David Montague, Chief Executive at the Housing Association, l &Q. So first, Oliver and I are going to have a chat through some of his emerging conclusions. Um, I'm going to call on Simon and David for their expertise, and then it's over to you in the audience to bring your own undoubted expertise to bear. So Oliver, according to last week's uh, Sunday newspapers, you were apparently talking about the need to bring a war spirit to building homes, which worried me slightly because the Blitz was more famous for knocking down houses than building them. But could you, <laughs> could you perhaps elaborate on what you meant by that? What's the scale of the challenge? Well, uh, the scale of the challenge is quite considerable um, because uh, we are definitely not providing enough homes for our people. And uh, that's a pretty serious problem for a country. And I think everybody's more or less agreed that at the very least we have to add about a half to the numbers we're currently building, so to move up from 200,000-ish to 300,000-ish a year. The, the, the very specific problem that I was commissioned to look at is um, why it takes as long as it does take to build out very large sites, one, two, five, ten, fifteen thousand plus sites. Uh, and the answer I've um, come up with is that it takes a very long time, I mean, on average about 15 years. Mm. Um, uh, I think that the longest was 48 years, wasn't it? There, there was one rather exceptional case, uh, and there were some that were sort of uh, six or seven years, but they were grouped around 15 years-ish. Important, incidentally, to note that um, although people talk about these sites very often as you go around them and as you talk to people responsible for them, as if they were building a large number of homes, once you start looking at the proportions, mm. it's the proportion that's worrying. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, my conclusion is it's not terribly complicated. Um, the reason why they're built at the rate they're built at is that they're mainly at the moment the large builders on these large sites building open market for sale mm. housing pretty much though it does vary across the spectrum but pretty much of a pretty similar kind very much centered on sort of three and four bedroom homes uh, in a pretty standardized setting very often and there's a certain market for that mm. and they build as many broadly as they think they can sell broadly at the price of the second hand market for similar homes in the local area. And that's not rocket science, it just is what limits the rate. Mm. Uh, so now what we've got to do is work out how to change that situation. Because you talk about this, don't you, as, as an absorption rate, you know, how yeah. much can the market around cope with before house prices start falling and before they start disrupting um, the existing market around them. But the complicated fact is that doesn't just determine retail prices, it determines how the land is valued in the first place. So in a sense you get a reinforcing cycle, the developer paid this for the land, therefore wants to get this back for the houses, therefore can only sell, you know, can only build them at a certain rate without flooding. Well that's absolutely right. You're, 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 once the developer has paid or the, the builder has paid the promoter or the landowner or whatever, um, the residual um, value that comes out of the so-called gross development value, which is calculated off the local second-hand uh, market price, less the construction costs, which are pretty well determined, um, uh, the, the builder is then locked into selling at that price because otherwise they're not going to make the profit they uh, need to make to sustain themselves in, 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 in financial circles. So 
the analysis I uh, have come up with is again very simple, which is if you want to change this equation, what you need to do is to address many more markets mm. on these sites. You need to address uh, more deeply than we do at the moment through Section 106, the social rented accommodation, affordable rented accommodation, uh, uh, shared ownership, um, the private rented sector, students, retirement homes, self-build, custom build. And it's not just a question of the tenures and the sizes, it's also a question of what I call the soft features, the architecture, the design, the character, the setting, the surroundings, because uh, when you or I go and buy a home, we're not just thinking of what shape and size it is and how much it costs and how many rooms it's got, we're thinking, would we like to live there? Mm. And different people have different views about where they'd like to live, what kind of place they'd like to live in. If, if they all look the same, there'll be a certain market for that. But if you have another group of homes in another setting on the same site, there'll be a different market for that. And I came to the conclusion that uh, actually you could create several different markets at once on these very large sites. Obviously not true on a site of 10 homes, but it is true on a site of 5,000 homes. And if you do that, then uh, the absorption rate will shoot upwards. And I think we could, roughly speaking, double the rate of building. That's, that's what I hope to be able to produce recommendations to achieve so on these large sites. that average time. Yes. I, I hope you can get them built out not at 6.5% a year over 15 and a half years, but uh, at 12 or 13 percent in seven or eight years. And of course, there's a very close relationship here between the build-out rate for houses for sale, obviously at the moment, often determines the build-out rate for rented or affordable houses as well, because the, the developers cross-subsidising one from the other. Yes, I go further than just say often. I think it almost always does and must, because the way that the Section 106 mechanics work, exactly as you say, is to cross-subsidise one set of things by another set of things. So until you build the open market homes, you don't build the social rented homes, by and large. Uh, it, you might build a group of them, but then you have to catch up. And so it, in the end, uh, it's the open market housing that's determining things. If, on the contrary, we can move to a situation where uh, housing associations, among others, can get onto these large sites directly themselves, um, uh, then there's much more opportunity for speeding things up. So you're not just necessarily, when you talk about, and the, the paper concludes that, that, that this kind of much more mixed, varied sites are the answer. So you're not just talking about a mix of architectural styles or a mix of, of houses or a mix of sizes or whatever. You might be talking about a mix of providers on the same site, so oh, more definitely. than one, not just one big developer control. Absol site. Absolutely, yes, yes. Uh, now, of course, there's a difference, as I point out in my paper, between what we can expect and hope to do for the sites that are already under construction, mm. where somebody is already in ownership, the whole pattern is set, and I certainly don't want to recommend anything in the autumn that would disrupt, because mm. the last thing I want to do is slow down it's building. Up, yeah. But of course, there are many, many sites that uh, including very large sites, that are somewhere in the pipeline, many of which haven't even got to the stage of being allocated in local plans. And uh, with those, I think, uh, we can do uh, more exciting things. So there'll be a range, I think, of recommendations uh, moving from cases where the site is almost finished back to sites which uh, haven't even been thought of yet. And when you talk about mixing up these sites more, so we're talking about potentially increasing the share of homes that are meant to be for rent or the share of homes that are meant to Definitely. be affordable? Definitely, yeah. yes. I, I think it's, it, of course, this is not an immutable fact. It might change. But at the moment, it's very clear that, that in some, and it varies by area, but in some areas, there is a large untapped uh, need for and demand for private rented accommodation, for example, for student accommodation, for um, retirement living and so on. Uh, in other uh, areas, and in fact in most of the areas, uh, I think, of how high housing need, there is a large untapped um, and unmet demand for social housing and affordable yes, housing. Yes, I think you describe it in the, in the report as a virtually unlimited demand. Yes, everywhere I went, people said, if we could build more social housing and more affordable housing, we would find takers for it more or less without... So why aren't they and why hasn't it happened? Well, because it's arranged at the moment in this Section 106-ish way, where broadly you build at the rate you build for the open market, you cross subsidise mm -hmm. by taking a bit of the land value and plonking it into the social rented, and that determines the proportions, and I think everyone in this... Uh, audience uh, who consists of experts will be very, very familiar with the game that then ensues of the, um, uh, the builders and their um, uh, helpers and advisors trying to argue with the it's council. It's like weasel out of their six or one or six. That, that's certainly the yeah. way that the council see it and the, the way the builders see it is the council's trying to insist on the unviable and that this is an unproductive uh, 
encounter, and I hope that in our recommendations we will find ways of uh, uh, getting past that, mm. that, that unproductive encounter. You do have a look in the report at some of the reasons that developers often give for slow rates of build out, you're blaming infrastructure projects that don't come in around it at, on time or utility companies being slow to come in also and, and you you give those sort of quite short shrift well um, it, by and large yes um, I looked at whether there was insufficient financing whether there were problems of material supplies whether uh, there were large ranges of skilled uh, occupations that weren't available in sufficient quantity and so on and mostly I didn't find any evidence at all that these were slowing things down um, in fact, I couldn't find any evidence that any of them were currently reducing the build-out rates from the moment of the first implementable permission mm -hmm. to the time when the site was finished. I did find um, two things, however, which I've stressed in the uh, report. Uh, one of which is that um, before you get to the first implementable permission, it, especially in the case of big brownfield sites, you very typically need to engage in remediation of the land and the provision of major infrastructure. Mm. We've got the world's expert on this on my left here because uh, the Barking Riverside project, uh, I, I really haven't ever been able to find out how long it was, but it's 20 or 25 years or so of conversations went on about how not to decide to extend the Dockton Light Railway to Barking. Uh, eventually they decided that they would um, uh, extend the London Overground instead. That is now happening and um, Barking is proceeding. Uh, There's a wasted uh, quarter, quarter of a century, century or so. Then, yes, yeah. mm -hmm. And that's an extreme example, but actually there are quite a lot of examples of cases in which long before you ever get to the thing I was looking at, which is the build-out rate, mm -hmm. you, you have with these complicated large sites uh, the delay of infrastructure. Uh, I mean, take the case of Ebbsfleet, for example, where... Um, it was only once the HS2 line was there that you could open the site up. Now, uh, sorry, HS1 line was there. You could open the site up. And uh, I have made, therefore, a very strong plea in my draft report that government uh, across all departments, because it's very complicated terrain, and agencies and so on, should, should mobilise. That's what I actually refer to the wartime spirit in relation to. Uh, should mobilise to get together to look at the places where infrastructure was not only needed but would liberate a large amount of housing mm. and try to advance them much, much faster. The A14 in Cambridge, which wasn't a site I happened to look at, but when I was a minister, I was very conscious. Year after year after year, people would be discussing what are we going to do to liberate the housing that could be liberated by uh, the reinforcement of the A14 and it, a, a very, very slow process. So that's one thing I did identify we really could do, um, and that would accelerate the time at which my clock starts ticking. Yes. Um, the other thing I discovered was that, that there may be other professions, but there's at least one skilled profession where there's going to be uh, too few people available to do a particular job, and this is bricklayers. Yes. Um, uh, it's very clear that if we're going to increase the amount of building as much as the government intends, and as I hope my recommendations will help to achieve, uh, we'll then suffer a significant shortage, about 15,000 bricklayers worth of shortage. And while the training providers can certainly increase their training by, say, 50% to make sure that on a steady state basis we could uh, have as many bricklayers as we'd need, actually that gap, that sort of 15,000-ish gap, is too big to, to deal with suddenly. And presumably you have to factor into that Brexit, the fact that a lot of that workforce on building sites comes from the EU now and may not come well, Afterwards. yes, uh, but personally, I'm, I'm, we're sort of diverging into high politics here. Personally, I, I'm of the persuasion that uh, although we're taking control of immigration uh, uh, during the Brexit process, we will end up with much the same group of people actually in this country because I think we, we actually need them. But anyway, uh, let, let's, let's... Hope you're right. <laughs> we'll see if you're <laughs> right. <laughs> let, let's suppose for a moment that, that nobody left, and you're absolutely right, Cindy, that in some parts of the country, particularly the South East, particularly oh. in London, the Romanian uh, bricklayers are a significant uh, component. But, but just assume that they stayed and assume that you don't import any additional um, uh, bricklayers, then what you need to do is to find some means of having a sort of crash training programme, which I think could not depend on the training providers, the FE colleges and the like, because I don't think from talking to them that they could scale up fast enough. And therefore, I think we'll have to find some way of getting the government to work with the major house builders to train people on the job and uh, I don't know how to do that, and it's not a business of my report to explain it, but uh, I've posed that as an additional like challenge for government in the report. I want to talk a little bit about land banking, because you do um, touch on that quite a lot in the report. The, what you're describing 
um, which is a process of developers going at the speed they feel the market can bear, essentially preserving their profit by doing so. That's not technically land banking, as in they're not sitting on land, not even trying to start building. But it's probably what a lot of ordinary voters might think of as land bank. It's the thing that frustrates people, which is the idea is that developers are going slower than they could do for their own reasons. And that's not what people stuck in rented housing want, is it? Well, I think that that's, that's largely right. I, I think um, when, I, when I began this uh, exercise, uh, enormous numbers of people came to me with the solution. Um, uh, uh, long before I had any serious grip on the problem. Uh, my experience in government was that if you produce solutions to problems you don't understand, they're never very good solutions. So I was determined to focus on the problem. A large number of other people came to me explaining the problem. And uh, some of them were saying that it's frustrating to watch these sites being built out very slowly, which is indeed what I focused on. Uh, quite a lot of other people said, well, actually, it's all about land speculation, and the big builders are just sitting there on these huge portfolios, and they're, they're speculating on, on land values. I think what I've discovered is it really is true that they go at a stately pace on these large sites because they are doing what they are doing, and that has an absorption rate that it has in just the way we've been describing. And that is frustrating for locals who watch this large site developing very slowly and ask why. Um, but it's very different from land speculation. And I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that in somewhere in Britain there are uh, people who are speculating about land. I mean, there are people who speculate on anything you've mentioned. Anything, exactly. Not just. And there are certain anecdotes I've heard of uh, people who um, get a planning permission for another house in their back garden or whatever and don't build for years and years and years and are hoping, presumably, that it'll have a high value when they've sold the house and so on. So um, no doubt there is land speculation going on. I don't think the major builders are doing it, and the reason they're not doing it is not uh, to do with uh, some saintly characteristic. It's to do with the fact that's not their business line. Mm. It's not their business plan. It's not how their whole business operates. They make money out of building and selling homes, and what they want to do is to sell a lot of homes, but at the price that the second-hand market determines, because that's the price they pay for the land and it guarantees their profit. So in one sense, there is land bank. In another sense, there is not. They are not engaged in evil speculation. Uh, what we need to do is to speed them up on these sites. But they are essentially engaged in what any business would do, which is seeking to preserve its profit margin. And is there a mismatch there sometimes between for-profit developers who have an incentive to preserve their profit and what people might want, which is faster housing? And in some ways, you know, people might want the market disrupting. They might want... Many people support new building because they think it will bring prices down. And that, in a sense, is, it's a form of market disruption that they want. Well, I think we have to distinguish very carefully here between two very different propositions. I think there's no doubt at all, uh, for all the reasons we've been talking about, that there's uh, ample room and indeed great need for more social housing, more affordable housing, more specialised housing of a large range of kinds than there is on these sites. And some of that is done by people who are in the not-for-profit mode, and some are, is done by people who are not major builders who nevertheless seek profit. And we need all of that, and we're not getting enough of it. So in that sense, yes. Um, but uh, I don't think it would be, and I go into this in the report, at all a cunning plan uh, to try to arrange to ensure that a huge number of additional uh, uh, for open market sale homes of the same kind as are currently being produced on these sites uh, were produced in addition. If we simply asked one of the major builders, or forced one of the major builders, to build twice as fast exactly the same mm. things they're building, this would not be good for the rest of us because, uh, actually, if you look at the uh, economic history of our country over the last hundred years, you can pretty much match the times when we've all had terrible recessions uh, with lousy consequences for people's jobs and prosperity and so on to the times when there's been a house price crash. And the last thing you want to do, therefore, is create uh, uh, the circumstances that could precipitate such a, a crash in the open market uh, for sale housing in a particular area, because it could, who knows, I wasn't able to find anybody who could tell me, but it could start ricocheting to other areas. So I, I think the clear route through this is to accept the absorption rate that is currently going on for the things that are currently being built, but get a heap of other things built which won't crash the house price, but will mean that the people who can't afford those house prices can nevertheless get homes on these large sites. Last time government was building at this kind of rate, 300-ish houses, 1,000 houses a year, was under Macmillan, and a lot of it then was 
social housing. Uh, and this time the, the burden is going to fall on, you know, on the market to provide. Are you confident that the market can provide? That? Well, first of all, I'm not saying that it's just all going to be market. On the contrary, I think that housing associations have an enormous role in the expansion that I'm talking about. Um, I'm thinking uh, about direct building by councils as well at this point. Oh, yes, that too. I, don't, I, I, I think we have to open up to uh, a, a wide range of additional forms of ownership and tenure here if we're going to solve this uh, problem. Um, uh, and, and, and I think if we do that, yes, this is entirely achievable. Um, uh, but I'd like to say something else about the contrast with the Macmillan time, because while it was certainly true that a very, very large number of homes were built then, many were not um, built in a way which was either beautiful or uh, very uh, well designed from a structural point of view. And uh, that's not good. Um, uh, it seems to me that, and I've been very clear about this in the report, that in designing policy recommendations for the budget, uh, my panel and I need to look very, very closely at what means will ensure not just that these sites are built out faster, but that they're built out more rather than less beautifully, and that the homes on them are well designed and well constructed. I think we owe it to future generations to do that rather than simply build a very large number of additional homes and live to regret it 20 years later. I know it's some months before you produce your final recommendations, but are you thinking that moving to these kind of more mixed sites requires is it legislative change or behavioural change or are there things that local government can do already that they're not doing? How do we move to that point? Well, I don't know the answers to those questions yet. Um, uh, and that's exactly the sort of thing we need to look at. What are the levers? I do know now what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve a mix of types and tenures and designs and settings and uses of housing on these large sites. How do you get that? I don't know. I think I'm clear already that it's very unlikely that we'll find the same solution for the sites that are already in progress mm. and the sites that are far from being in progress and haven't even been allocated, and indeed the sites in between those two that are perhaps allocated but not yet having outline permission or have outline permission but haven't got to fully implementable permissions or whatever it may be. And so we will look at all the various stages of these sites and try to come up with a range of policies that can address each in a suitable way that respects existing rights uh, and maintains existing profitabilities, but also quickly achieves an increase in provision on the existing sites and provides a sustainable basis for continuing to have faster progress as new sites come into the planning system and come out the other end. Have you been surprised by anything you've discovered while you were doing the review? Um, yes, lots of things, as usual. <laughs> um, the, the, the thing I was most surprised by, I shouldn't have been surprised by because I discovered as a minister that statistics very often mislead you. But um, uh, the, 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 um, the case of the bricklayers that I mentioned mm. is an absolutely fascinating example. My, my friend Danny Alexander, who is a coalition partner in the coalition government, used to refer to government as um, being like driving a large combine harvester and looking in the rear mirror to see what had been knocked down behind you. And, That's a reassuring uh, thought. The, 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 re <laughs> re the reason he said that um, was that you get brilliant British statistics, this were better than anybody's statistics, I think. They're m one of the finest groups of statisticians in the world. And they'll tell you exactly what Britain was like about three or four years ago. Yes, yeah. But they Not don't now. tell you really yeah. anything about what's happening at the moment. Um, and um, often these brilliant statistics, which are absolutely accurate, also tell you something completely not what you thought they were telling you. And uh, when I asked my uh, splendid uh, team of officials to go and look at the question of these bricklayers, because I was hearing all sorts of anecdotes yeah. about tightness in the bricklayer market, they went off and they, they looked at the uh, Office of National Statistics statistics about bricklayers, and they showed that um, actually there was no problem at all about bricklayers. So the, the salary is absolutely flat, and what's more, they were about so half what I was hearing anecdotally. Now, I, uh, uh, I grew up, um, when I was working for Mrs. Thatcher, under the aegis of a marvellous man called uh, Alan Walters, who was her uh, economic advisor. And he was fighting a sustained battle at that time with the Treasury because the Treasury model said there was no problem with the British economy. And he was saying there is a problem with the British economy. And I, uh, he was, as it turned out, right. And I said to him, Alan, how did you know this? And he said, well, I have a very simple test, which is I never pay any attention to the statistics if they contradict the anecdotes. And... Um, I, uh, I use, he said, taxis. 
because taxis are the most discretionary expenditure in Britain. You can always do something other than having a taxi. Nowadays, you can even get an Uber, but in those days, you know, you could get a bus, you could walk, you could cycle, you could drive your own car and so on. And so it's very discretionary. So if the taxi drivers tell you that business is tough, business is tough and you've got a problem in the economy, whatever the Treasury model says. Well, in this case, I thought to myself, ah, oh, Alan Walters, I mustn't listen to this uh, set of statistics. I must attend the anecdotes. And we went and found out, and you'll be interested to know that the anecdotes were right and the ONS, though completely accurate, was completely misleading because what it was measuring was the, roughly speaking, 10% of bricklayers who are employed. 90% uh, ish of bricklayers are self-employed. And it wasn't measuring those. And then when we found uh, a firm which specialises in hiring uh, for contractors uh, self-employed brickies, they gave us a completely different chart, which actually tallied with the anecdotes and showed that bricklayer salaries had shot up, or rather bricklayer earnings or costs had shot up, and therefore um, actually there is a problem about bricklayers. <laughs> it was a fascinating insight into how um, you mustn't ever just read the official statistics and think you know the truth about life. A useful lesson to us all there, I think, probably. Uh, I'm aware that a lot of you will have questions. I'm sure you're already well-versed in using the Slido app, um, but you, it's the, the uh, hashtag, if you need it, is uh, CIH Housing 2018. You'll to log in to Slido and put your questions. Uh, before I come to those questions, I'm just quickly going to ask David, um, as your organisation is... If, if government really is a combine harvester knocking things down behind <laughs> it, your, your organisation is kind of the wheat field here. Um, so <laughs> what did you make of Oliver's conclusion? Do you think he's going in the right direction? Is there something here that housing associations can work with? Definitely. I th and just, uh, Oliver, listening to you speaking and listening earlier on to the housing minister speaking, how much has changed in such a short space of time? We've moved you know, it, from just a few years ago, a complete obsession uh, with home ownership to having now a minister that is talking about aspiration in terms of uh, what it means for renters as well as owner, homeowners, recognising that everybody wants a safe, warm, quality, affordable home regardless of their income. It feels like we've made a big step forward. And Oliver, when you first uh, uh, wrote that letter to the Chancellor back in March, yep. um, for you to recognise that the problem was absorption, there was kind of there was a Mexican wave across the sector because finally somebody somebody gets it. And if I can just you mentioned Barking Riverside, if I can just use that as an example, um, that vast industrial wasteland remained a wasteland for many decades. And uh, despite uh, their best intentions, uh, Bellway, who were the, the house builder at the time. Um, because of absorption rates, they could only build about 100 homes a year. They could only build what they could sell. And if you look at Barking Riverside, it's not the kind of place that people would, would uh, naturally buy. And so uh, along came l and and bought out Bellway. Um, as a housing charity, we put £70 million of our own money into that railway station because for us it was a no-brainer. It just completely uh, unlocks the site. And, and we're now moving from 100 homes a year to 800 homes a year. And, uh, and we're speaking um, with Homes England and, and briefly with you as well about how we can do much, much better than that. How can we do it? By investing across all tenures, by dealing with this issue of absorption. And so one of the great things about housing associations is that um, we, we take a long-term view. We don't look at the housing market through a, a three-month window. We're not worried as much about absorption. We're funded through the bond markets. Mm. We take a 30, a 40, a 50-year view. We invest all of our surpluses back into affordable housing. And we can adapt. As the market changes, we can adapt between tenures. And that means for us, embarking, um, we, we will take all of the sales risk, we will build out all of the market rent, all of the intermediate rent, all of the London living rent, all of the social <laughs> rents, all of the shared ownership. And that means that we can have not just many sales outlets, but many different tenure types as well. We'll invest in all of the infrastructure as well. And it is a completely different way of building out. And so I think we're, we're doing, Oliver, what you're saying must be done. And it's not just L and Q. Uh, housing associations are an ambitious sector and we want to do so much more, and it now feels like we're moving to a situation where we can have a sensible conversation. An outbreak of harmony on the panel. It's, it's lovely to see. Um, if we'd like to come perhaps to the audience now for some questions, I'm sure there will no doubt be an outbreak of harmony here as well, or perhaps not, uh, and see what's coming up on Slido. So the most popular question looks like it is, should the government use compulsory purchase powers to acquire land for housing supply in areas of unaffordability. 
Oliver. Well, uh, as I said to you, I haven't yet got to the stage of um, thinking about what the right way to achieve what I'm um, now clear we need to achieve is, and that means I haven't found uh, yet which are the right levers. I don't think we should discount any possible uh, lever, um, but I am clear that, um, that we need to ensure that uh, there is a method of parceling up these large um, uh, sites so that the very different kinds of things that we've all been talking about can be done on them. Uh, and uh, exactly what that method is, I think we, we, we will need to find out. But it, it clearly does also mean that as we move forward in time, there has to be a method for local authorities to ensure that there is much more rapidly than there has been in the past land assembly. Mm. Um, uh, because you can't get these large sites together in many cases unless you have some means of assembling the land. So whether it's that or any other means, we're going to have certainly to look at levers for that. Simon, is there any uh, sense in which compulsory purchase powers are on the table? So, I, mean, I, I mean, I agree with what uh, Oliver said and the next stage of his review is going to be crucially important, but the, the, sort of the, the broader uh, question behind this, which mm. is very much uh, how the government is thinking about uh, what we need to do to support and stimulate the increase in housing supply across the piece is to, uh, to use some of the powers uh, that we've got back in the autumn budget when the government announced a large packet of reforms uh, to support housing supply. A large part of that was the work that is now underway uh, under Ed Lister and Nick Walkley to uh, strengthen uh, and increase the size of Homes England. Uh, they have substantial powers uh, and to build the capability to use those powers where appropriate to really drive and stimulate greater housing where it is most unaffordable at the moment. So uh, more broadly, we're thinking um, about these things. And I think that uh, as Oliver does the next stage of his work, um, how we direct that and how we can use that, particularly on these issues around the very largest sites will be uh, important. David, did you want to come in on that? I think there's, a, there's before we consider whether or not uh, CPOs are necessary, I think there is a, a bigger question, which is you know, where are these homes going to come from? And I think in order to answer that question, we need to take a much longer term view and have a discussion not about 300,000 homes a year, but 3 million homes over 10 years, because that really gives you the perspective which is, which is mm -hmm. necessary. Where are we going to find the land that is needed to build 3 million homes over the next 10 years? And, uh, and as part of that, CPO may be the answer, but you've got to start with that, that bigger question, first of all. Talking of bigger questions, um, the next most popular one, oh, they're changing. Uh, if you were starting from scratch, would you design section 106 differently? And if so, how? I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver's going, that's the purpose of my review and I'm not <laughs> telling you now. <laughs> oh, well, I, I know I can do something. Um, uh, I, I think um, almost everybody we spoke to um, accepted the need for some set of devices that ensure there is a large amount of social housing and affordable housing on these sites. So in that sense, Section 106 is a very good thing. Almost everyone we spoke to, and uh, anybody in this audience who really um, suffers from sleeplessness can read the 300 pages or so of um, annexes of my report, which take you through the, the various meetings we had with innumerable people. Uh, almost everybody I spoke to that said anything about Section 106, from whatever side of the picture they came, uh, thought it was a pretty cumbersome, pretty uh, difficult, as I say, rather contested terrain. So I am certainly not starting with the assumption that the uh, inevitable truth is that the right way to do this in the long run is using Section 106. Yeah. The aim of Section 106 is right, the mechanism may or may not be the best long-term solution. David, is Section 106 still fulfilling its purpose or? Uh, yes, but it's an agonizing process. It, it, it creates- There you go, that's what everybody said to me. Um, <laughs> and exactly what we got uh, and local government. Entirely necessary so. when you, know, you put in a room a local authority that wants the most for their place and a house builder who perhaps has shareholders to, to think of. And so that, that tension is there from the beginning. I think, uh, so I, I think it's unlikely that it's gonna change. However, uh, our experience um, of working in a strategic partnership 
with the Mayor of London just puts you in a very different place. And so we, again, when we look at Barking Riverside, we start with an open book. We start with a business plan that we built ourselves. And we agree that we need a new railway station. We agree that we need seven new schools. We agree we need 65,000 square meters of commercial space and green spaces. Mm. That's what we want. We want the place to be uh, sustainable. We want it to be a beautiful place in the long term. And so I think there is something to be said about a different strategic relationship between house builders and government. Yeah, I was, I, I should just, sorry, I should just say, I was really struck going to Barking uh, and one or two other sites only are the ones I visited uh, by what a transformation there is mm. when the local authority, in this case two different local authorities and one regional, one local authority and the developer, in this case a rather unusual um, housing association developer, are actually working together rather than mm. against one another. Yeah. That is a very considerable shift and I'm certainly very impressed by that and we'll need to think through how we can try to replicate that spirit as we move forward with this. Simon, you... The, the only thing I was going to add and is, and I agree with David's point about uh, the uh, strength of strategic relationships, is, is that the Section 106 is one part of a broader uh, system and set of things that happen that take you to particular um, points in debate and negotiation and the way that the plan making system works, the way that the viability uh, assessments work uh, alongside how section 106 itself uh, operates and uh, is operated is, is really important to see in the round um, and actually how developers can work with local authorities with uh, national agencies over time in a strategic way is, is one way for sure to think about those things together. Next question, does the fact that houses are selling at a slow rate on large sites indicate there's more to the housing crisis than supply? That's one way of interpreting your report. Do you think that there are other factors than supply involved? Well, um, uh, uh, I mean, in, in, in one sense, the answer is obviously yes, uh, um, because the, the point about the absorption rate is that it's an absorption rate for open market housing at the prevailing price. And the reason that there's a low absorption rate at the prevailing price, I remember I was looking only at areas of high housing demand yeah. and hence high relationships between prices and incomes. In fact, I only looked at places where there was a, a median house price to median earning ratio above seven, which is enormous. Uh, there are a lot of places like that in, in, in our country today. And in those places, what's limiting the absorption rate is unaffordability. Yeah. Now, there are very, very large numbers of people who'd like to buy the homes I was seeing built, many, many more of them. They couldn't afford them. So uh, what I'm trying to do is to get to a position where the government has the means to open these sites up so there are other forms of housing on them that can be afforded. Um, and, and so it's not just unlocking supply, it's unlocking demand by making sure that the supply is the supply of something people can afford to get into. Mm. Anyone else want to come in on that one? I think, again, this, this kind of obsession with home ownership uh, is, the, I think, the, the single greatest thing that, that prevents us from building the homes this country needs. And uh, if you rely on a cyclical market to build 300,000 homes a year, 3 million homes over 10 years, we're just not going to do it. So we need to recognise that we, that, that we as, a, as, a, as a nation, we have to invest across all 10 years. Mm. That, that aspiration to own, of course it's there, and so we need to create pathways mm. to ownership from wherever you are today, from whichever tenure you are in today, there needs to be a pathway to ownership because that's what people want. But we shouldn't build everything on the assumption that people are gonna buy today. Okay. Do you think that shift is, is happening or has happened already within the department, Simon, the move from assuming that, that ownership is the, the be all and end all to accepting that Rent is, just, rent is just as important, I mean, social housing is just as important. I mean, I think you heard some of this from the Housing Minister earlier uh, earlier this afternoon. There is no question um, that uh, there is a lot that we do and will continue to do to support home, home ownership, um, the numbers of people that aspire to uh, home ownership. But equally, um, through uh, a lot of the uh, wider work we've been doing for some time, um, partly to support greater supply, partly because different people want different tenures of housing are in different positions and uh, uh, are in different points of their life and, and, and value different things. We need to be uh, working across uh, the industry to support development of a, of a wide, range of, uh, wide range of tenures and opportunities around uh, built to rent and how we develop an institutional private rented sector, uh, questions about student housing, questions about uh, affordable and social housing are absolutely critical to address uh, the overall 
uh, housing crisis. Um, that isn't just about market supply for ownership. It's a much bigger question than that. Uh, there's a question here from Tony Stacey. Does Oliver Letwin agree that the housing market is, in essence, broken? Should local authorities be let off the leash? Now, those of you who are here for the local government uh, session this morning will have heard um, many ways in which local government is already letting itself off the leash, <laughs> so to speak. But this question of whether power should be devolved um, is an interesting one. Well, uh, I'm not uh, commissioned to um, advise the government about the whole relationship between central government and local government. Um, thank goodness. Um, but, uh, but I'm clear that actually, uh, under the, uh, uh, the rules which have been brought in since 2010, the uh, local authorities have very, very wide, in fact, uh, except where explicitly restricted, unrestricted powers to act commercially and uh, establish development corporations, development companies, and so on. I've seen some examples of that at work. Uh, we have examples where they are actually well, in fact, you, you, you have a development company, but it's jointly owned, I think, between the local authorities and yourselves. That's another model. It's a very interesting one. I'm absolutely convinced that this is all going to work only if the public sector side of this equation is also got into the right shape. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, so the recommendations we make for the long run are not just going to be uh, on the assumption that these large sites go on being... Uh, bought and owned in the way that they are at the moment, but rather uh, we have an open uh, field for policy making here and we'll try to look at what is the best way for the public interest to be served in relation to these large sites while maintaining the proper profitability of the various kinds of builders and developers and so on that are involved. Simon, is there a tension always between its government that will be held accountable for any failure to build according to its targets? but it's not government that's necessarily directly delivering. There's a tension there between wanting to, not wanting to let go <laughs> of control of that agenda and this pressure for, you know, more for local councils to be able to yeah. do perhaps what suits their area rather than necessarily what suits the government's overall. I mean, I think, I think there are a couple of really important things in there and there's no question the role of local authorities uh, with respect to uh, increasing housing supply is enormous. They're the lo local planning authorities, they're allocating uh, the sites they're setting the planning environment which is more or less uh, friendly for uh, market developers and uh, investors they have opportunities to set up housing companies invest do different, and we're seeing a lot of different uh, a lot of different models around uh, the country we've also been working with a, uh, a number of places um, taking a different approach uh, through housing deals where we've had a great agreement with the councils across uh, Oxfordshire to sort to support more strategic planning and to provide investment support infrastructure to drive higher numbers of uh, house building over a period of time. Uh, there's work going on in combined authorities, like here in Manchester, um, to work in a uh, to work in a slightly different way. So, uh, of course, there's always a balance between the role of central government, the role of local authorities. But that is that is something that we are addressing and talking to uh, different authorities uh, about what might work best for. Them. The question of who's accountable where is a, is, is, is a complex um, uh, one um, and obviously a lot of political accountability uh, rests in central government and we're certainly under an enormous uh, uh, amount of uh, expectation in the department to help uh, work across government and meet the ambitions the government has set. But equally we need uh, councils to be getting local plans in place, to be allocating the amount of land uh, that is needed in their area and there are quite a lot of reforms that have come out since the uh, white paper, some of which are being uh, implemented through the National Planning Policy Framework and other ways to actually make the accountability of councils clearer um, uh, for what they're doing and what they can do and to balance that with some things that uh, can support them to carry out the very important role that they have. David, did you want to come in on that? Uh, just briefly, I think I mean, the, the, uh, the, the new flexibilities that councils have to, to raise money, to, to borrow money to invest, I think are to be welcomed. But I think there is, just, there is so much more that, that can be done. And if you compare local, the local authority experience to the Housing Association experience since the 1988 Housing Act, over those last 30 years, housing associations have, have raised 80 billion of private finance. We've invested in the best part of 3 million homes. Those homes are now generating a surplus, and we're investing that surplus back into new homes. And if local authorities had, that, had enjoyed that same freedom over the same period, 
then we wouldn't be sitting here today. We'd be speaking about the housing crisis in mm. the past tense. And so I think it's important, as we did, we, we, we developed a relationship with, uh, with investors. We had to build business plans. We had to gain their confidence. I think it is right that local authorities should be given that same opportunity. Mm. It won't happen overnight. And uh, between now and then, it's essential that we work together. We've got time for one last question, uh, which uh, I'll go for. Should developers be subject to financial penalties if they don't build out planning permissions within an agreed timetable? So if it looks as if they're dragging their feet for not good reason, should they be fined? Well, that, that's something that uh, a lot of people said to me when I began my uh, work. And um, uh, uh, I, I think I have uh, absolutely established that this would not be a sensible thing to do. Uh, either you would set the rate at the absorption rate, in which case it, it would just be a, a facade, a, a mm. fantasy. Is they're built out of the absorption rate anyway. Or you'd set it at a rate faster than the absorption rate. And in that case, the builders would have to build faster than the rate at which the houses can be sold at the market price, mm. in which case you'd have to drive down the market price. And then you would risk destabilizing the market. Um, instead of having a, a quite different approach is what I'm recommending, we should have a lot of other kinds of things going on in these sites that don't affect the open market um, housing uh, price directly, but enable people to get on the site and live on it in places they want to live in, or, uh, or in ways, whether through shared ownership or affordable renting or whatever it may be, uh, that are suitable for them. And that, I think, is a much more sensible approach. So you'd rather speed up the absorption rate, essentially, than, yes. than, than find people for and try and push them to go faster than the absorption rate? Yes. It, 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 once you realise the problem is the absorption rate, you realise that the solution cannot be to pretend that the problem isn't the absorption rate. <laughs> do you agree with that, David? I do. I think the, the answer is less about punishment, more about partnership. Sounds like a yeah. <laughs> uh, note on which to end. Uh, could one final question? I think we can manage. Uh, we have. Should oh no, sorry. Could uh, disappeared as I was asking it. Could more public land be made available for housing development? Um, yes, I can answer that. The answer is yes, 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 yes. Um, are you uh, sure you don't want to hedge your bets on that one? Uh, no, I do not want to hedge my bet on that one. I spent years as a minister trying to eke public land out of uh, the Ministry of Defence, the Department of Health and various other agencies. And uh, 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 the Ministry of Defence is currently sitting on an estate, roughly speaking, the size of Wales. It has as much land as it had when we had two million people under arms. Um, this is not a sensible way for our country to run. At last, I, I gather from Homes England that there is some serious movement. Um, uh, there's much, much more we can do. And actually, I think, and the public sector land, uh, if properly handled by Homes England, uh, can uh, come together with my report and be a sort of poster child for doing the right thing with these sites, because there you don't have the issue of uh, somebody else owning it. Mm. The public sector already owns that land, and it could use it in a way which means its build-out rate is much faster, and it's built beautifully and sustainably, and uh, produces homes you know, we can be proud of in a setting we can be proud of, and, and that is urgently necessary. Uh, this, we are not going to get through this whole thing without making much, much better and faster use of public sector land. Why do you think it's so hard to winkle land out from under your colleagues? Why is the MOD so attached to Salisbury Plain or wherever it is? I, I, I think that when people enter certain kinds of public agency uh, by osmosis, they acquire the view that someone sooner or later is going to require them to come up with some money that they won't have. <laughs> and therefore, they would like to keep their grip on any asset which could be sold against that eventuality. I think that's the reason. But whether it's that so reason it's or some other... So it's been saved for a rainy day, I think, I yeah. think it is, and we cannot afford to do that because we're sitting in the middle of a rainstorm. We, we really have to use this stuff. Simon, are there any... any, any Encourage, is there any encouragement, shall we say, that the department can apply yeah, to so colleagues I mean, I, I, their own the, 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 the department's answer to the direct question would be the same as mm. uh, Oliver's. Absolutely, more public land can be made available for housing development. And um, there are uh, some, ambition, some ambitious targets that the government has to, to do that and to bring uh, much more uh, forward. It's, it is practically very difficult to do. Yeah. Um, there is definitely a very big 
question uh, about how we can get the right incentives in place on different I was going to say, what incentives to do that? You there, there are also some uh, sort of genuine issues that different departments need to work through to make a bit of the NHS estate available. You have to get the hospital off it or mm. part of the hospital off it or whatever's on it off it. And uh, I'm sure some of that can be done more quickly um, uh, than uh, it is in different ways, but we need to, uh, need to do that. And then quite often, uh, and this depends on the type, type of uh, site, but certainly if you're talking about big MOD sites, quite often there are questions of uh, clear up or infrastructure or other things, which again need to be thought through, which come to the broader points of, uh, of Oliver's review. But undoubtedly, this is an area where uh, much more could be done. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. But thank you very much to all our panellists for their uh, spectacular answers. Thank you very much to all of you for your spectacular questions. And uh, many thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Alison Inman, the president of the Chartered Institute of Housing, and Terry Aliphant, the chief executive of the Chartered Institute of Housing. Names are being taken of people who are leaving the room. Um. Terry. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you for being here at Housing 2018. I hope you've all had a great week. I first want to take a moment to wish an especially warm welcome to our delegates of the future. They are the young housing professionals who are joining us here at Manchester for the first time. And you guys are the future of our profession, so thank you for being here and I hope that you're enjoying your day. It's a great honour to stand here today. It's a privilege to be a CIH president because that gives you the chance to see the work of so many brilliant housing professionals. And wherever I've gone this year, I've been greeted by great people doing great work to make a difference every day. And with that in mind, I want to start by issuing a challenge today, which I'm going to refer to for the next few minutes. And I'm gonna call it the Getting On With It Challenge because I'm a firm believer that a big part of our success is going to rely on us doing exactly that, getting on with it. One thing that always comes across clearly during this event is the scale of the housing challenge we face. This week, we've heard about the desperate need for new homes and the many other severe and complicated aspects of our housing crisis. And like you, I'm under no illusion that a big part of the solution to those problems lies in the form of more investment from government and in other policy changes which lie outside of our hands. But, and this is a huge but, a massive part of that lies in our hands. Because for every challenge we've heard about this week, we've heard from an organisation who are finding ways to meet it and continue to make a difference. And that is what we have to do. We have to just get on with it. And it was in this spirit that I chose Women's Aid as my presidential charity. And when I made that choice, I wanted to do much more than raise money. I wanted to raise awareness of domestic abuse and start conversations to get us to do so much more on this crucial issue. I remember dealing with domestic abuse early on in my career, and I would never have believed that three, maybe more decades later, we'd still be talking about it. And yet, here we are. And it seems to me that in some ways, we've made so little progress. And we've been in a position where, by and large, housing organisations 
haven't perceived this as a major issue for them. And I don't understand that. We house millions of people. And we believe that a home should be safe and secure. And if we're not able to achieve this, then we are quite simply not fulfilling our duty as housing providers. And I can't say it more clearly than this. These are our homes, our people, and this is our problem to deal with. The term domestic abuse tells you everything you need to know about why this is an issue that we should all have at the very heart of our businesses. And that's why earlier this year we decided to do something about it. And we joined forces with Women's Aid and the brilliant Domestic Abuse Housing Alliance and launched the Make a Stand Pledge. That's a campaign that encourages organisations to unite to support people who live and work in social housing who are experiencing abuse. And we created four focused actions. First, to introduce and embed a policy on domestic abuse so that cases are properly dealt with and people can come forward to get the support they need. And frankly, it seems strange that this is not already a requirement. We are legally required to have policies on all sorts of things, like allocations and antisocial behaviour, but incredibly not domestic abuse. Allocations and antisocial behaviour are not killing two women a week, and domestic abuse is. So, we should all have a policy and we should make sure that our teams have the skills and the training to make sure they can identify, report and deal with cases of domestic abuse. And of course, as well as housing many thousands of people who experience abuse, we also employ many thousands. So the second part of our pledge is about having a policy to protect and support our staff as well. And the final two pledges are really simple, but we think they'll be very effective. We want organisations to make the details of local and national services easily available to residents and staff so they can get support. And we want every organisation to have a named senior person to drive an approach to tackling domestic abuse from the top. And I believe that these are four commitments that every housing organisation can put in place and that they will make a really big difference. And the brilliant news is that you clearly agree. Um, we launched this campaign just under a month ago and the response has been brilliant. Um, I'm going to let the figures speak for themselves. Within our first week, 50 organisations had signed up to the pledge. And this week, we've reached over 150. They include housing associations, local authorities, ALMOs, and providers of housing in every corner of the UK, from Southampton to Shetland, and Northampton to Northern Ireland. And the best bit of all, those organisations collectively own and manage more than one and a half million homes. That's more than a quarter of all the social housing stock across the UK, and they employ tens and thousands of people. That's brilliant. So I want to say one thing to everyone who's been involved in Make a Stand so far, to, to Women's Aid, to Kelly Henderson and Goody Burnett, who are the women who founded the Domestic Abuse Housing Alliance and the first people to make the case for us to do much more on domestic abuse. To organisations like the National Housing Federation and the National Federation of Almos, who've supported us all the way in getting this out there. To Inside Housing and to 24 Housing, who've supported the campaign so brilliantly. And to all of you who've signed up and supported Make a Stand. Thank you. 
thank you for embracing this campaign with open arms, for understanding that domestic abuse is something we need to understand and we need to deal with. And thank you above all for taking the opportunity to take direct action that will help many, many thousands of people get the support and help that they need. It's no exaggeration to say that what you're doing will save lives. If you haven't signed up already, there's plenty of time. We'd love you to join us. Wouldn't it be great if we could get every organisation on board and cover every home across the UK? And at this rate, that's a real possibility. I said before how important it is for us to come together and just get on with it if we're going to solve the housing crisis. And what's been brilliant about the campaign is the extent to which housing organisations have done exactly that. And I think as a sector, we've passed the getting on with it test with flying colours on this. I think if we can take that spirit forward into our wider work, we could achieve so much. Because the simple fact is, whether we build, manage, sustain, support, whatever our role, there is something that unites us. And that is that we all play a part in providing the most important thing that anyone will ever have in their life, and that's a home. No single organisation, no type of organisation can solve the housing crisis. From councils to developers to contractors, housing associations, caregiving organisations, the list goes on. And each one of us has our own role to play. And it's about time we got as far away as possible from arguing who's more important, who does what best, and who is the most, I'm going to depart from the script here and do bunny ears, innovative. Because I can tell you this, the people sleeping on the streets of Manchester tonight do not understand or care one bit about that. They need and deserve a home. And to be frank, we have to cut the crap and get on with it. I'm going to get on my soapbox a minute as if I've not already been on there. I've just realised that. Um, because I'm only ever going to get the opportunity to do this once. And quite frankly, apart, unless Terry's going to wrestle me to the ground, it's too late for anyone to stop me. Um, <laughs> that'd be a really good way to end the coin. <laughs> my money's on me. Um, <laughs> but, you know... Um, to the journalists out there, that's the bit that says check against delivery. Um, it's often said that we're the stewards of this world, that we have a duty and a responsibility to leave it in a better place than we found it. And those arguments have been made particularly strongly about the environment in recent years. But they're just as relevant for us. And we are in such a privileged and responsible position, and we must never understand that. We own and manage a resource which has existed in some form or other, often for many, many decades. And it when it boils down to it, we provide something that is so hugely important to everyone, a home. It's our responsibility to make sure we do everything we can <coughs> to provide that for as many people as possible. It's really as simple as that, and we have to get it right. So just take a moment, look around, um, think about the conference. How far removed is this from, from the lives of many of the people that we exist to help and to support? This fantastic venue, the beautiful food we've been treated to this week, the excellent networking events that we've attended, and the wine that some of you have had to drink. We're the lucky ones, aren't we? And I'm not having a go. I don't want to make anyone feel guilty. Of course, most of us do this because we recognise it as a means to an end. It's how ultimately we'll learn, we'll make contacts, and we'll help us to secure the homes and the services for the people that need them. 
but there's a discipline that we've all got to be so careful to maintain. We've got to get what we do the right way round. If we're being innovative, if we're building new homes, if we're driving surplus, that's brilliant. But it should all be with the people we serve at the forefront of our minds. We shouldn't ever try to be the first or the best just to be the first or the best. We've got a duty to use the surplus we generate wisely and striving to be competitive and great at what we do is fantastic as long as it's always done for the benefit of the people who need a home. And that's what I've loved so much about being CIH president because CIH exists to help housing professionals everywhere be the best that they can be, but only so that they can help people. We recognise that the housing world has changed significantly in recent years and that this brings new challenges for you. And we recognise that we have to change as well. We've listened to you and we've heard the same thing again and again over the last 12 months. More than ever, you want to make sure that you have the skills and the knowledge that you need to the, be the best that you can be at your job so that you can provide great homes and great services. And in response to that, we've reviewed our offer to make sure that it maximises the opportunity for you to do this. We've got ambitious plans to expand our training offer with new modules to support professionals at every level. We've continued to expand our knowledge hub so it becomes the go-to source of knowledge for housing professionals. And we're always looking for ways to add value for CIH members. This year, that's included the launch of a new online career development course, the expansion of our mentoring scheme and new free training sessions. We've recognised the need to expand our base of younger members, introducing a new under 30s rate. And I can assure you that we will never stop finding ways to help you to do what you do. I want to pay a special tribute to our colleagues from across the nations of the UK. They do fantastic and crucial work to represent our members in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, where being tuned into the unique policy landscape is absolutely critical to the success of our professional body. It's the only way we can make sure to, that we equip housing professionals everywhere with the skills and the knowledge they need to make a difference. And I want to welcome our delegation from Hong Kong and pay tribute to our members around the globe who all make a difference wherever they are. And as this is my last big opportunity in this role to stand in front of so many people, to, uh, those who haven't left, um, and make it their day-to-day -day business to help people. I want to use it to thank every one of you so much for the work that you do. I've been so lucky. I see great people doing everything they can to provide housing for people, sometimes in the most difficult circumstances imaginable. You should all be so immensely proud to be part of that collective effort. And it doesn't matter what your job is. You play a part in helping people to get access to one of the most important things that they will ever have. Something that will shape their life, that will give them a chance of safety and security and help them to lead the life they want to lead. What an amazing thing to do. And if we can do more to tell that story, to get across the unique opportunity that a career in housing gives you to make a difference, then I have no fears for the future at all. Being a housing professional is so much more than just knowing things about a lot of things or being great at customer service. A housing professional does have the knowledge and they do have skills, but also operate with professional standards and within an ethical framework. A housing professional is the complete package. Our work and our relationship with the people who live in our communities is so much more than a transaction. We've got a special relationship in which we have a duty of care and a responsibility 
to scrutinise our actions and decisions, and we must always remember that. Octavia Hill once said, you cannot deal with the people and their homes separately, and that really does sum it up. It's something we have to constantly keep in mind. And during my time as president, it's exactly this approach that I've seen time and time again. So what makes this week so special is that it's a chance for us to come together. H housing 28 has been a platform for housing professionals everywhere, a chance to learn, debate and challenge one another to continue to be better, to make a case to the government that we need more support to do our vital work. But fundamentally, we need to lead the way ourselves. To not wait to be given support, but to find ways in its absence to help as many people as we can. To just get on with it. So I hope that you go back to your organisations with new ideas, reinvigorated, re-energised to do the crucial work that you do. Thank you for being part of that collective effort. Thank you for challenging yourself to be the best that you can be. And thank you for doing the work that you do. Thank you. Well, we're almost there. We're almost there. It won't keep you for very much longer, but just, just it's for me to, to finally um, call the conference to an end. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, another conference very nearly at the end, and um, as ever, the week has flown by. Um, as I stand here, I remember the feeling that I had at last year's conference and how very, very different it feels today. Um, what I'm taking away this year is an overriding sense of positivity. I don't know if anybody else has got that sense, but the conference has just felt much more positive and sort of forward-looking, and, and I think that's really pretty special. Um, though we will obviously need to continue making the case for, the, for more support for our work, for government changes and whatever, I think the thing that has struck me is that we have the capacity, we have the tools, and above all, as Allison has said, we have the people to meet the major housing challenges we face. Um, so I do believe quite strongly that this is our moment and we should grab it. And that it is the time, I think as I was saying in my opening speech, to reclaim social housing. And in Allison's words, really, just by going away and getting on with it. Um, and I think that's my sense of this conference. And to be frank, it's the strongest case that we can make in demonstrating the value of what we do. Um, so all I want to do now, really, is as many of us know, this event is a major, major undertaking, as you can imagine, and every year it gets better, and I think this has been really a fantastic conference. Um, and I just want to thank many of the people who took part to really make this happen. So first of all, I want to th thank Sarah Paling, who you, you may see around the conference, usually elegantly dressed and rushing from place to place. But Sarah from the Ocean Media Group and all of her team for doing such a fantastic job just to make everything run smoothly. I mean, it's just been incredible. I'd like to thank my own team for everything they do and including, um, you won't be surprised to know, making sure that I'm in the right place at the right time. And that is a big challenge, let me tell you that. Um, and then to all of the staff at this brilliant venue. I mean, they really have been wonderful, very friendly and just helping us all sort of know where we're going. Um, a big thank you to all of our sponsors for making this possible. And finally, just a big thank you to all of you for coming here this week. And as Allison said, for the amazing work that you do every single day. So let's just go away and together let's get on with it. And um, finally, just to say, have a great journey and enjoy the English game. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye.